Matthew chapter 8. And then after probably this Sunday, we're going into our Christmas season. Doesn't it look beautiful? And, you know, stopping in Chicago just for a couple of days, man, I tell you, I felt like staying a week. But uh, just the atmosphere there with all the, the lights, as soon as you pull into the, the airport, you're driving out of the airport, they have all these lights, everything's decorated. As soon as you, you come out of the airport, you know, on the way to the expressway, going into the city, they have it all decorated, beautiful color. I mean, you just can't help but to get in the spirit of Christmas. And uh, going into the city, you see all the lights everywhere there. Even the horses and the carriages, they have little Christmas hats. And, you know, everybody gets into it, even the horses. Amen. But what a beautiful, beautiful atmosphere. I couldn't even enjoy it because I was just locked in the cave, you know, trying to get well. And, uh, but, man, I, it was so beautiful to be there. And how many have been enjoying the Christmas season so far? Yeah. Amen. You got your Christmas tree? Or you still, how many got your Christmas tree already? Your lights put up already? I ain't got nothing. No. no. But thank God that, uh, you know, the kids and those, they were able to, you know, get a Christmas tree and different things up, set up over there. And, and we know that the Christmas tree is, it's, you know, it's, it's not about the Christmas tree, right? It's not about, you know, Santa and the reindeer and all that. We know that Jesus is the reason for the season. We know that. Amen. But it's a celebration time. <coughs> Where we just, it's a season of giving, a season of love, amen, expression of love to one another. And it's something that just reminds us, in a sense, reminds us that this is the way for a Christian, it should be all the time. That a Christian should always be joyful, celebrative, right? A Christian should always have love and peace in their heart. A Christian should always be generous and giving and loving, amen. And, and it's just a season that kind of reminds us of how we should be all the time not just during this season. And so, so we celebrate the birth of a king, the birth of, of the son of God, the birth of a savior, the one that God the Father sent into this world to save humanity from their sin. And so today, as we get ready, you know, we want to just remember that as we look at the lights and all this, it's a reminder. It's a reminder of wh who we're celebrating, amen, why we're celebrating, why we put up these, these lights, amen. In fact, when I look at the light, what does the Bible say? Jesus said, you are to be the light of the world, right? We are to be the light of the world. And, let, and as we serve God and we do good works, that all men will glorify God because they see our good works. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. And how many know we don't do good works to be saved? We're, we're saved, and therefore we automatically do good work because it's now our nature the God's nature inside of us. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. So let's remember that, that as we get into that spirit of love and celebration and joy and gladness and peace and giving, let it remind us to be that way all the time. Amen? All, somebody say all the time. All the time. Amen. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to read here a few scriptures. And we've been talking about the kingdom of God unleashed. And remember there in Luke chapter 16, verse 16, where he talked about what Jesus said, until the days of John, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. And when you read that passage of scripture, Jesus is saying to us, he's emphasizing that the kingdom of God is forcefully advanced through preaching and pressing in. Preaching and pressing in by proclaiming and declaring the good news to all the world and by pressing in, taking hold of that kingdom. And I don't want to labor all the messages and, and time that we spent in, in, in preparing for that, but we talked about, we're talking about a few things. So the question that we asked ourselves is this, how can you and I partner together with God in, it force, in, it, in forcefully advancing his kingdom and unleashing his kingdom through the vision and ministry of Victory Outreach and through our life, and through our life. First of all, number one, we talked about that it must be done with spiritual passion. That if we're going to be used of God, if God's going to use us to impact a hurting world, starting with the world around us, then there must be spiritual passion. That, 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 that dynamic, that hunger for God, for souls, 
for righteousness, for justice, for mercy, amen? Those things that we should be passionate. In other words, we're passionate about living for God, serving God, amen? That today we don't live for ourselves, we don't live for anything else, but we live for God, amen? He is our king, not only our savior, but he is our king. Therefore, we are totally in subjection, in obedience to his authority, his rule and reign over our life. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. And if we're gonna serve God, we must serve God with spiritual passion. Secondly, if we're gonna advance the kingdom of God and unleash the kingdom of God, it must be done through a passionate pursuit of prayer warfare. I remember when we talked about Ezekiel, how Ezekiel, God carried him, captured him, by the spirit and brought him into the valley of dry bones and asked Ezekiel a question, can these bones live? Remember that? Then he told Ezekiel, now prophesy to these bones and these bones started coming together bone to bone, right? That God raised up a mighty army, but yet there was still no life. There was still no breath in them. So then he told Ezekiel, now call upon the four winds of heaven. Call upon the breath, the four winds of heaven, that, the, that, they, that God may breathe upon them and they may live. And when he prophesied and spoke to the four winds that called upon the power of God's anointing and life upon them, God raised up a, a mighty army that was ready to do God's will and serve God's purpose. Amen? And so we talked about how important, we talked about a lot of things, but we talked about how important it is. It's one thing to be gathered together as a mighty army of God, but if there is no life in us, no spiritual dynamic, spiritual power, then we're not going to be able to advance God's kingdom. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about that passion pursuit of prayer, but I want to try and see if we can conclude this soon so we can get into some other things. But the third point, that we want to look at in advancing the kingdom of God is that the kingdom of God must be advanced also with an expectation of the miraculous. An expectation of the miraculous, which requires faith. Everybody say faith. faith. An expectation of the miraculous. Now, this is where we want to pick up here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. The word of God reads like this. Now, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one but go your way and show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Then in verse 5, it says, And Jesus, when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak the word. Speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority and having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, to those that followed, assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> and Jesus said to the centurion, Now go your way. And as you have believed, so it shall be done to you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, once again we ask for the precious anointing and ministry of your Holy Spirit to have the freedom to speak to us, to give us a rhema word to someone here today that needs a healing, needs freedom. Maybe the enemy has tormenting their mind and they need freedom from the 
from that oppression, those that need salvation, God, those that need, Lord God, deliverance, or whosoever needs a breakthrough here today. Lord, you are our healer. You are our God. You are our everything. You're all powerful, almighty God. There's nothing too hard for you. And whatever may be impossible they're facing now, we know is possible in your power. So we acknowledge you as king this morning, as Lord of our life. Have your way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, we find in this passage of scripture that Jesus speaking to a leper and also to a centurion. Now, we're talking about miracles here this morning. We're talking about the miraculous. Something that we've been witnessing, many of us, in these last maybe six, eight, nine months or so, as we begin to passionately pursue God and begin to ask God for, for healing of our people. Many of our people of our congregation have been diagnosed with sicknesses and infirmities and many that at one time were on fire for God and really active in God and now because of these ailments or these, these infirmities, the enemy has tried to neutralize them. But we have come together as a family of God and we have come together as a church. As the Bible says, if one hurts, we all hurt. And if one rejoices, we all rejoice. But together we came in agreement and says, no devil, you're not going to have them. Amen. And there was so many that the enemy took them so far, but that's as far as he was able to go. And through the power of prayer, we've been able to see the power of God heal them. Amen. And many of them are sitting here this morning. Amen. Be healed by the power of God because God is not finished with them yet. And so many other situations and circumstances that we prayed for, for God's miracle working power. Because whenever you are involved in partnering together with God and advancing the kingdom of God and wanting to see the kingdom of God unleashed within your life, your family, or ministry, listen, it must be done with a passionate pursuit of prayer warfare. Therefore, he who comes to God must believe that he is God and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Somebody help me out here this morning. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Whenever there is faith, whenever there is a sense of faith, whenever there's an ounce of faith, listen, it's that faith faith that moves the heart of God to want to reward someone, amen, because they put their trust in God. So we're talking about the miraculous because Whenever you are moving in the power of God, in the power of the kingdom, you're going to see the miraculous. You're going to see God move. You're going to see things begin to happen. You're going to see things happen that would normally not happen. What's impossible with man all of a sudden becomes possible through God. What society cannot do and different other situations cannot do for people, God, you're going to see step in and be able to do it because somebody had enough faith. Somebody believed God that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what we find here, when, when we started this message, we talked about Jesus preaching the kingdom of God, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And going from town to town and village to village, we've seen the miraculous power of God being unleashed through Jesus. Where the Bible says there in chapter 4 that, that miracles were taking place. Those that were sick were being healed. Those that were oppressed were being set free. Many demons were cast out. That his fame began to spread throughout all of the regions. That people began to come from everywhere because they heard about this man called Jesus. They heard about blind eyes being opened. They heard about crippled men rising up and walking. They heard about the dead being raised. They've been, they were hearing about lepers being cleansed. So they were coming from everywhere. Amen. The sick, the hurting, the broken, the troubled. To hear this man and to be touched by this man, Jesus. It was a miraculous move of God. What Jesus did when he started his ministry, he started a movement. It was a movement of the miraculous. It was a movement of the power of God. It was a movement of people's lives being changed and households being impacted and cities uh, turned upside down and right side up. Amen? 
And then we see him going in at in chapter 5. He goes on, the, on this mountainside and he begins to deliver these messages, this, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, if you will. Amen. And as he begins to speak, and what you find here is you find Jesus giving about 10 mini messages from chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. You'll find 10 mini messages, which maybe later on we'll go through them. If we're going to live for the kingdom, we got to know how kingdom living and what kingdom living is all about. Can you say amen? amen. And so he gives these 10 mini messages. And then right after that, from chapter 8 on, you see 10 miracles. 10 messages and then 10 miracles. As to look into Matthew's perspective as Matthew saying, listen, this is what Jesus said, but now look at what Jesus has done. Because what he has done is what validates and authenticates what he said. And what he said and what he does validates who he is. See, who, because of who he is, amen, uh, validates what he says and also what he does. Well, I don't know if you're in this, you know. But in other words, let me tell you something. What he said, amen, is confirmed by what he did. The miracles. Because miracles happen that nobody else can do. In fact, some of these miracles only God can do. And therefore, because of what he did, it validated what he said. Remember, he spoke with authority. As he, pre as he preached these messages, people were confused. They were amazed. They never heard preaching like this. They never heard teaching like this. It was blowing their mind. They never heard someone speak with such authority. And what he said, amen, he goes on and starts to do. And when he goes out of those messages, he starts going and all of a sudden he starts healing this one and casting out that one. And miracles begin to happen. Every, Matthew begins to show what he does. So what he does validates what he said and what he says and does validates who he is. God is God. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so these 10 mini messages and then 10 miracles. And the first miracle that we run into is the miracle of the leper. It's the miracle of the leper. Now, here is the first miracle. And, and these first three, is, he deals with people. And, and you have to understand something. Let me make something very clear from the very beginning because a lot of times people are too focused on the miracle rather than what the miracle teaches. See, every miracle that happened was not just to do a miracle. It was to teach something. And so, so this is why it's important that, that as a believer, it's not so much about the miracle in itself as it is the miracle worker. And so you see that, that when these miracles begin, and the first miracle that we see happen was that of the leper. Now, if you're familiar with leprosy, leprosy was, is a, a disease that's incurable. It just, it just continues on eating and eating and rotting away its flesh. Well, no matter where it starts, where it begins, it just continues to eat away, eat away. Doctors didn't have answers. There's no amount of money that you can give that can, uh, can, can help cure this disease. There was nobody, there was no one, there was nothing that society can do to cure leper. In fact, lepers, because of that, were outcasts. They were like rejected from society. They had to live in their own communities. They weren't allowed to be associated with normal people of society. In fact, if a leper had to go buy something from the market or go into or get some food or something, or if the leper happened to be walking down, they would have to yell out and scream, unclean, unclean, to warn the people coming so they can go on the other side of the, tr the, the, the pathway. They were there was they 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 possess this un this incurable disease. Now, this this leprosy, this leprosy, you know, when you look at leprosy in the Bible, when you when you look at it, it's like it's like a metaphor, it represents sin. 
It's like a metaphor of a sinful, guilty life. That be, how many know that there's no one on the face of the earth that can cure sin? There's no one, there's some that, that, that no matter what society has to offer, what programs, uh, you know, what doctors, whatever, there's some sin that just, you know, it cannot help. Right, people, it cannot help. And it's, it's, it's a metaphor, it's like a metaphor of a sinful, a guilty life that, that only God can heal, only God can cleanse, only God can save. And so when we look at Jesus coming to this leper, we see that he has this bodily uncleanness. And it's an incurable disease that only can be documented, documented by a priest, like as in the Old Testament. It, as I mentioned, it's a representation for sin, a metaphor for incurable sinfulness that only God can heal and declare righteous or clean by his own standards. Now, Jesus comes to this leper, or this leper, should I say, comes to him and asks him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus then responds to this leper by saying, I am willing, and he touched him. Now, right there, when Jesus touches that, because it was the law, nobody was to touch a leper. Anybody that touched a leper would be considered unclean themselves. But Jesus breaking all Levitical law and all customer law, whatever it is, he reached out because of his heart of love and because of his heart of compassion. When this leper came, who came with a broken heart, psychologically, emotionally messed up because he was an outcast, he was a reject of society, he was cast off because of his condition. When he came to Jesus, cried out, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You can make me clean. If there's anybody that can heal me, if there's anybody that can cleanse me, if there's anybody that can make me right, if there's anybody that can set me free, Jesus, you're the one. And because of the heart of love and compassion that Jesus had, he reached out and touched him. And he says, I'm willing. How many know God is willing to reach down and touch the worst of the worst? that nobody else wants, that nobody else wants to work with, that nobody else wants to associate with. Listen, God is not like that. God is no respecter of persons. All souls belong to God. Every man, every woman, every teenager, every child, the Bible says was fearfully, wonderfully created by Almighty God. Therefore, they have a special place in the heart of God. And no matter what bad decisions, no matter what circumstances or situations happen, and they found themselves in a bad state. Listen, God is still willing. Jesus is still willing to heal, to save, and to deliver. Somebody got to give God a shout. He heals this leper. He does what nobody else in this world can do. Who's calling me over here? Don't they know it's church? They should be in church, man. I, I wish I could find who that is. Amen. <laughs> it's because I'm using my phone as notes. <laughs> he heals this leper. He does what nobody else can do. But then he tells them this. He says, now go show yourself to the priest. Go show yourself to the priest. The point is, in keeping up with the Old Testament law, go show yourself to the priest, according to Leviticus 13, where only a priest had the authority to declare one clean, which I doubt took place. And by Jesus saying, go now and show yourself to the priest, I believe Jesus was saying to that leper, go show yourself to that priest and you tell him who cleansed you. 
Go and tell that priest who set you free, who cleansed you, as to alert to the priest that the Messiah, the King, has come. Hallelujah. Because only God would be the one that would able to cure this kind of incurable disease. So he says, go show yourself to the priest and tell him who cleansed you, amen, so that he will know that the Messiah has come. The king is here. Because he does what no one, because he did what nobody else can do. Because leprosy was viewed as incurable unless God did the miracle, right? So here's Jesus saying to go tell the priest that I'm the one that did this for a testimony. How many of the, there's a power of testimony? That's why your testimony is so important. Some people don't realize. Some people, oh, you know, I don't want to talk about nothing. You know, I just want to think about the future. The pre-. Listen, the power of a testimony. Here Jesus is telling, go tell, you, tell, tell the priest what happened as a testimony. For a testimony. Amen. Of who's here. Amen. The king is here. The Messiah has come. Every time you go and share your testimony of what God has done for you, the miracle that God has done, the amazing grace that God has shown, let me tell you, it's a testimony of who he is, that God is still here. Jesus is still alive. And Jesus still has the power to change and transform whosoever. A testimony, the power of testimony. testimony of complete healing by Christ the Messiah the anointed one has come and I believe that most confirm that this man was a Jew it's interesting because when you look at these first three miracles it's first a Jew but then the next one is a Gentile And then later back to a Jew. But why a Gentile? Which leads us into the next miracle that we see of the centurion and his servant. See, here we find this centurion. Now, centurion was a Roman leader. He commanded, I would say, about 100 men. He was a man that had a commander who overseed thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. And a centurion was a leader, an officer over a hundred. So here's a man that understood authority. He understood what authority was all about. He understood when one has been delegated authority and he understood one who has been given full authority. He was a centurion. This Gentile, this centurion must have heard of Jesus Christ. Part of that fame that was spread must have came to his ears that he was opening blind eyes and making the cripple walk and, and casting out demons. And, and all of a sudden his own servant, now this servant must have been close to this centurion. An officer Kind of gives an insight into the heart of this officer, this leader. He, who, who, who must have loved his servant. Cared very much about his servant. See, good leaders take care of their people. Good leaders don't just, you know, lord over people. They don't just uh, exercise authority over them. They lead them. They serve them. Why would this leader go out of his way to go find Jesus to bring him to heal his servant? Gives us an insight into the heart of a leader. And so he calls, goes to Jesus. And when Jesus is coming, he looks at him. He says, don't don't come any further, Lord. He says, would you please come? And I have a servant that's that's sick. He, He probably to the place of death. And Jesus probably seen, here's a leader. Here's a leader, and if I can get this leader, if I can reach this leader, I could probably reach many others. So Jesus responds, I want to go to your house. I'll go and I'll heal him. But being the leader that he was, 
tells Jesus, no, stop, hold it, Jesus. I'm not worthy for you to even step into my house. I'm not worthy for you to even come into my home. But I understand authority. I understand that you're a man of authority. I'm a man under authority. I have authority. I say to one, go this way, and he goes. Come here, and he comes. So he tells Jesus something very powerful. He says, you don't have to even come any further, Jesus, because of who you are. All you have to do is speak the word. Just speak the word, Jesus. Because I understand authority. And if I, am a, if I can recognize authority, you are a man of authority. A man sent from God. A man that's been delegated and given full authority over sickness, disease, infirmity. Therefore, you don't have to come any further. Just speak the word. Oh, hallelujah. And Jesus was blown away. He was blown away. He was he marveled at what this man said. He turns to everybody around. He says, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. There's that word faith. Remember, it's not about the miracle. It's about what the miracle teaches. I have not seen in all Israel such great faith. As to say to all of Israel that unbelief will not get you into the presence of God. Unbelief will not get you close to God. In fact, unbelief will exclude you from the presence of the kingdom. Remember I said from the very beginning of this sermon, this series, that every time the message of the gospel of the kingdom is preached, it's a, it's a message of salvation and it's a message of judgment. Because there will be those that will receive it. They will be keen enough and convicted enough to sense that this is God speaking, that this is a move of God, and they're going to press into it, and they're going to accept it, and they shall be saved. But then there will always be those that reject it, because unbelief will never respond to the truth, no matter how well presented or how well demonstrated. Look at what it goes on to say. He says this, for I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The ones that come from the east and the west are the Gentiles. In other words, what he's saying there, he's saying, look, I came to the Jew first, but if the Jew is going to reject the message, then I'm going to the Gentile. And as as he's saying here, right here, he's saying now, even now, many Gentiles are responding to the kingdom. Many are going to come from the east and the west, and they're going to sit with Abraham, down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, in other words, those that should be there, the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, remorse and anguish of soul. You know when somebody gets angry, they grind their teeth, gnash their teeth. Huh? Let me tell you something. That's how people in hell are going to be. People that think that this was a fairy tale, that this is just some weird story that people made up, that this Bible that we read is just, a, just another book. All those that have their different funny little ideas about what we believe and, and how we believe and, and we believe in the word of God and who we believe in. Let me tell you something. They're going to be gnashing of teeth, such anguish and remorse that they'll never be saved.
So the point is, Jesus is warning Israel that unbelief will disqualify them from the presence of the kingdom. While belief is already among the Gentiles. And this is the important part that we don't want to miss. See, five times this statement, these statements are used in the Gospels. Weeping and gnashing of teeth and are always used to speak of exclusion. Exclusion from the kingdom. Cast into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So always remember that the message that is being preached, either we're gonna receive it or we're gonna reject it. And through this centurion, what he does is he exercises, and Jesus says, such great faith in all Israel. This is what Jesus Christ is looking for. In order to advance the kingdom of God, there must be an army of believers that believe that Jesus Christ is not only the Savior, but he is King. He is King Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is God. He is creator. Amen. He is the owner. Amen. He's the giver of all life. He is God. God, my friend. He is king. We are his people. We are his subjects. Therefore, we must submit to his authority. We must take preeminence over our life. He must take rulership, ownership over our life. And therefore, we trust him that in his kingdom, there is power. In his kingdom, there is healing. In his kingdom, there is salvation. In his kingdom, there is peace. In his kingdom, there is joy. In his kingdom, there is justice. In the kingdom there is mercy in their kingdom we must believe that he is who he says he is that we are here today in this season when we worship and we have this whole story about this beautiful baby born the Savior he is a son of God and he is king And we must believe it. The Bible says every knee shall bow and tongue confess. Whether they believe it or not, they're going to bow one day and they're going to have to confess that Jesus is Lord. Oh, somebody got to give God a praise. He was a man under authority. He understood authority. He recognized that Jesus had all power and all authority. And that's our king. That's my king. That's your king. That's the king we serve. That's the king we live for. That's the king that has given you and I power. That's the same king that has delegated you and I authority. That we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We can command demons to flee and they shall flee. Bible, Jesus said, greater work shall you do in my name. Greater work shall you do in my name if you believe, my friend. If you choose to believe that the same king, amen, that walked this earth, that, 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 that moved in the power of the kingdom is the same king that has delegated authority and power to you and I as a believer to unleash this kingdom, not only here in San Bernardino, but across this nation and around the world. Hallelujah. 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 Do you believe in King Jesus? Do you believe in his authority? Do you believe in his power? That he still has a power to change lives, to impact cities, to reach the nations for the glory and the honor of Almighty God. To God be the glory. The glory be to King Jesus. Hallelujah. He is your king. And he is my king.